All right, ladies and gents, we finished up the Stones River campaign from the Army of the Heartland. All right, Army of Tennessee's campaigns, 1861-63. This is a class of arms games, a John Prado's design, 1996. So Kev from over at Big Board posted a question to me about how I compare this to GCACW. Um, the comment, the maps are nice. Yeah, they are nice. Rick Barber maps. Got to love them. The detail that's in them. Um, so here in my answer to Kev was, uh, for, for command and resources, uh, now granted, now I have not played the advanced versions yet of any of the great campaigns. So where you have supply and stuff and I will, I will get around to that, but for ease of play, uh, and to main in maintaining, you know, some historical accuracy, GCACW stuff, I think is, is best. Uh, and plus the fact that they have a lot more games and cover a lot more of the, 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 the theaters, um, and scenarios. This one here, now I've played two of them now. I've played Look Away from Against the Odds, and I've played this one here, Army of the Heartland, which would I think is the second one in the series, because Look Away was in 2007. This was 96. And of course, somebody posted on there what the first one was, and I need to start looking for that. Um, if you want depth, um, this is it for a campaign level Civil War game. Because, all right, so great campaigns, you have fatigue levels. So you can physically move all your units. And they just start accumulating fatigue levels. And then, you know, you reach a point where either they can't or you want to stop. Okay, so the version of that in here is you have these um, war effort points. And you have an operational bid at the start of each uh, turn. So if, you, and I'm not going to get into the details of the operational bid. I already did that and look away. So if you're, if you are playing on a bid of two, if it's your turn and you had a bid of two and a bid of two, and that's what you're using, you're going to use a particular movement chart. Okay, let me pull that over here real quick. So you've got these movement charts and you'll see they're like one through six. Okay. Um, so whatever you bid, you're going to use that forces leaders movement rating on the appropriate bid chart. And you're going to roll a die to see how far they can move, which to me is really, it's another fog of war. It's really, really intriguing to me. So, um, the commanders, they have an administrative rating, a battle rating, and then they have a movement rating. Okay. Um, like in great campaigns, you can have, when you have multiple units in a hex, you can put them under a force marker. So that you don't have the big stacks of units on the board, okay? Uh, I don't think there's any cost associated with having all those units like that together. Um, you know, you might have division commanders, corps commanders, or army commanders that can affect combat. In this game here, such as, let's say, these two units right here. So, those two two-star units, they cannot be in a hex together unless there is an army headquarters in that hex. So in this hex here, you've got, uh, who was that on top there? That is Buckner, Simone Boulevard Buckner, all right? But he is with Bragg. Bragg is an army, he's, he's the big dog in the area. So Bragg has the, was Army of the Tennessee headquarters. He's the army commander for this whole region. So he can have any number of subordinate leaders in his hex, right? The subordinate leaders, the, the, like the two star there, he can't have more than, he can have, you can have one division more than the number of stars on your counter under your command. Okay. Cavalry detachments, stuff like that. They don't count towards that, but, uh, your, your infantry units. So he could have three divisions, and since the Confederates are all their entries in brigades, he could have 12 brigades underneath him, 
subordinate to him. And you would put them over there on the chart. All right. So that's that's just where command starts. And then these guys, they have administrative points that they use to declare attacks and there's to create detachments. Like if he wants to kick out a unit, like a detachment to go send them off on a different mission away from the main body there, it's going to cost him a point. And then he, you know, maybe he wants to put a leader with it. Well, you'll have to go over to the leader pool. You'll have to pay points to pull one of these leaders out and put it on that force that you're sending away. So you have to mine this stuff. So you can't do all the wonderful things that you want to do uh, most of the time because you'll burn your points out. Now, I think the Confederates started with like 75 and I worked them all the way down to 29. So it actually it wasn't too bad. The Union, they had some leaders killed. And when you win a turn with a max bid, you spend 10 more effort points to for the initiative on that turn. It's like you're buying the initiative. So they were all the way down to, what, 19 uh, WP, WEPs, all right? All right, so here's how the game ended. <clears throat> it's a victory point system. And I probably could have added a few more victory points, but I don't think it matters. So the Confederates ended up winning this one. The 20 victory points, and the Union had 15. Uh, so not bad, not bad, not bad. Um, the cavalry force, John Hunt Morgan, that went up here and damaged that rail line, which really did nothing. <laughs> I probably should have studied. I think before I did that, I should have looked a little closer at the way supply. I should have read it again just to make sure because it didn't affect anything. And you get no points for it. And then he ended up strategically attritioning himself out two losses and he went back over in the leader pool. And now those the the enemy does not get victory points for units that attrition step losses. Okay. Um, Forrest, on the last turn, he rolled like a two on the movement. On a bit of four, and he you see what he's his movement rate is a five. He had like 23 movement points. Plus, he's a cavalry corps. So that knocked the dice roll down one more. Plus, he gets plus one for being all cavalry for moves. So he ended up with like 25 movement points, I think. He went all the way over there from the river here, from the bridge. He went all the way over and attacked that detachment, that naval landing, and won a smackdown victory. But there's no more turns left and no more impulses. There were no more impulses for the Confederates to be able to capture that naval landing. And I don't think there was any points for that either. So most of it's just leader loss and uh, uh, strength loss. If I had to say there's one thing lacking in this, victory conditions I think could be, could have a lot more added to it. But hey, you've got a very detailed game, so why not leave something simple like the, the victory conditions, victory points. All right, so the last turn we had Rosecrans, <laughs> Thank God the game's over because he's by himself with nothing but an engineer unit. So Rosecrans is applying his strategic or tactical plan for this fight in this game is not a good idea. It, I, I recommend you 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 do not split Rosecrans force up. Um, maybe you leave one wing split, but you keep two wings with him and then you have the cavalry because the, he just got picked apart and he, they, the units were strong, but once the morale, the morales got shot, that started causing penalties. So Rosecrans on turn two actually took Murfreesboro. Okay. But before turn two was over, the Confederates took it back and it hit him pretty hard too. I ended up having to, uh, See, the Union had two leaders that were killed. Two, no, they had one. And I replaced him with Sheridan. Sheridan's got some very, very good ratings. Uh, the Confederates, I couldn't take Polk's terrible ratings. So I replaced him with Buckner, and that cost 10 points to do that because they, he wasn't killed or anything like that. And poor, poor Polk got sent packing. Somebody's not going to be happy in the government. Um, and then to top it off, I tell you this to turn three, this was just one big punch in the nose for Rosecrans. We took Murfreesboro back and eliminated Crittenden's entire wing that was with him and chased him away. We went up and we knocked the depot out of Nashville because, um, what's his name here? Who is that? That is, oops. 
Oh, come on. Cleburne, very good commander. Confederates has some great commanders. Cleburne got a monster roll. He rolled like a one on his movement. So he went racing up there. And I want you to look on turn table four. He's got a movement rating of four. So if he rolls a one on a rating of four, he gets the Confederate. He gets 24 movement points. The number on the left is Union. number on the right is Confederate. I know it seems a little balanced, doesn't it? So he went up there and took on, you know, I didn't expect that to happen because I was going to pull back, uh, I don't know who's a Thomas or McCook that's right here. But I didn't, or I was going to pull this guy over. Confederates got lucky. He got a big roll, and off to Nashville he went. And he won that fight and took Nashville. So that, that would be more that would be more WEPs for the Confederates if the game were to continue. So, And I don't think that uh, McCook or Thomas down here could drive him out. I really don't. So, and then like I say, uh, Forrest went over there and captured that landing area. And that was pretty, that's pretty much it. The Union couldn't do nothing with it. So it ends in a 20 to 15 victory for the Confederates. Yeah. Look, yeah, okay, I won't, I won't deny that the rules, when I first pulled the rules out to look away and started to read them, I, I saw what everybody was talking about. I only had to send in for one rules clarification to against the odds to get somebody to clarify the rule for a rule for me. And it turned out while I was waiting for them to answer me, I found the answer anyhow. But after, like I say, and I've said it before, after I went through the rules once and I started to play, I realized, well, wait a minute. These rules are laid out in the sequence you play the game in. So you literally could lay this out skim through the rules to pick up the little odds and end details that don't that aren't sequence stuff which I that's really I don't know you know maybe the first couple pages of the rules getting to understand the counters and certain things like that but when you get into the sequence of play I'm telling you it is laid out the way you play the game when I do the reorganization phase I open the rule book and I go in and I go right down the list seeing what I need to do and you don't miss a beat. You get to, you know, one part of the, re there's probably 12 steps in the reorganization phase, and it walks you through each one of them. And if you don't know, look right in the book, leave it open, read what it is you're going to do, like building detachments, uh, constructing entrenchments, doing replacements. It's all right there in order. So I've had two plays now. From two different, from two two scenarios, from two different of the two of the three games, and I'm gonna tell you if you want something that you can rack your head against trying to decide which command decision you're gonna make, this is it right here. I don't, I'm not saying it's the only one, but for a Civil War campaign type game, this is it right here because it's got a little touch of everything in it. Um, if you've got one, get it back out, get it on your table. I'm telling you. <laughs> you will have fun with this game. There's no, and come on, the charts, those are great. For something made back in the 90s, those things are freaking awesome. Who, who wouldn't be able to read those? I mean, everything is there that you need. See, I got broken units on stuff in the broken units boxes, and I put all the eliminated units, so I set them off to the side. Of course, obviously, Billy Yank lost a lot more. Morale is terrifying in this game. There's not a boatload of informational counters. There's a few. And really, you don't touch most of them. All right? Get it out. Read the rules. Set a small scenario up and play it. Any one of the three. I don't know about the first one, but I'm, I would assume it's along the same lines. Um, I'm using, uh, well, the rules for Look Away and the rules for this one look to me like they were identical, just different booklets. Okay. Army of the Heartland. Army of the Tennessee's campaigns, 1861 to 1863. John Prado's class of arm games, 1996. I played the Stones River campaign, three turns, Battle of Murfreesboro, pretty much a campaign around that. Very fun, very good. I probably could have played this in a full night or a full day if I'd have just sat and done it, but too many other things going on. If you got it, get it out and play it. If you see one, and I know there's a bunch of Army of the Heartlands online, um, I've seen them, and they're not very expensive. I'm telling you, grab it. Very, very fun game to play. All right, if you want a puzzle, get it out and play it. All right, gang, if you like this stuff, you know what to do. Subscribe, hit that bell so you get notified whenever I do shoot something new. Um, give me a thumbs up if you like this stuff. If you give me a thumbs down, tell me what you don't like so I can correct that. All right? All right, we'll talk to you all later.